Well, good evening, and um, let me look at my notes. Okay. Uh, I can start and close anything with Abraham Lincoln, and um, I prefer to do that. And one of my favorite quotes from Abraham Lincoln is that the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present, and the occasion is piled high with difficulty. We must rise to the occasion. And America must rise to the occasion for the year 2012. Um, coming home yesterday and listening to the news with the president talking about stepping up in the fair share and Warren Buffett's secretary. <laughs> How many of you uh, are familiar with the play Sweeney Todd? <laughs> Let me that analogy. I, I, I may do not know what I'm talking about. I've never seen. Okay, well, okay, then I'll use the other analogy. To me, this is the equivalent of uh, we're in a medieval village and they got some guy chained to the post and they're flogging him, and then they turn around and say, "Well, it's only fair that we flog you and you too." Come on up. <laughs> it just it's the the logic is so but backwards <laughs> that uh, because the middle class is getting flogged at a certain percentage rate now let's flog everybody else uh, at that rate how many of you have ever seen the, the little video eat the rich mm -hmm. how many have not seen it oh okay that's your homework assignment tonight <laughs> go home go on youtube look up eat the rich it is dan have you seen it yes yeah. it's brilliant isn't it yeah. this guy points out how if you looted everybody who are actually the job producers in America, at the end of the year, you would have totally destroyed the country and you'd still have a deficit. Uh, even, even, even NPR last night was talking, I was shocked. I mean, I listen to NPR, I like to hear, I like the music and everything. Even NPR pointed out that if they confiscated 50% of all the earnings of every supposed millionaire in America, there would only be 10% of the deficit for this year. We are in the middle of class warfare. Well, let's talk about that a bit later. Uh, I prefer to keep it kind of short and sweet, and then we'll go into questions and answers. And if I'm squinting a bit, it's because I've learned not to do public talks while wearing contacts, because one of the worst and disconcerting things in the world is right in the middle of it, your contact pops out. <laughs> well, Dan here could help me, so I'll get up. But uh, so I'm on my glasses, and it doesn't quite focus. Okay, the, the book one second after. Uh, I just want to talk about that for about five or ten minutes, how that relates to us here tonight. <coughs> then we'll go to questions and answers and stuff. One second after is the story about literally one second after one of two events. Either America is hit by an EMP strike. Now, let me just explain quickly what an EMP is. Electromagnetic pulse. It is the byproduct of detonating a nuclear device. You do not need a large one. You don't need one of the big hydrogen bombs. To do it. A Hiroshima-sized bomb, properly calibrated, can do the same thing. If you detonate it 200 miles above the Earth's atmosphere, as the gamma ray burst from the bomb hits the upper atmosphere, it starts a cascading effect of splitting off electrons. That almost creates like a chain reaction of an electrostatic buildup going through the atmosphere. When it hits the surface of the Earth, literally a millionth of a second later, the buildup, the electrostatic buildup, could range anywhere from 500 to 1,000 volts, though we're now looking at the prospect declassified uh, that the bad guys are calibrating up to a gamma burst that could lay down an overload of 10 to 20,000 volts per square meter an electrical overload. What that means is, in that split second, that goes through the entire power grid of the United States. Every wire acts like an antenna. Picks up the overload, cooks everything off. Uh, I saw a video last year uh, at a conference on this the vulnerability of our high tension wire distribution system. We got hundreds of thousands of miles of those wires. Now, if you laid them out and you figured out between each pylon how many square feet of wire you actually got, how many square meters, the overload would essentially blow out all of that. So even if the generating system survived, there's no way to get the power back out to us. Estimates are that 
five years after an attack like this, 80% of America's generating capacity would still be offline. The reason being, where are the replacement parts made? Not here. And we live in a just-in-time delivery system now where there is no longer the stockpiling and warehousing of crucial strategic supplies within our electrical industry in almost every industry. And most of this stuff is made in China. So I can really picture they're going to be rushing to help us. Um, but, you know, after five years, we would not need 20% of the electrical capability that we had before. Because according to the congressional study, which is a valid one, uh, it was headed up by Congressman Roscoe Bartlett, who is one of the great men in Congress. He's a genuine, real PhD in the hard sciences. And I I'll tell a story about government efficiency with him in a moment. Uh, according to the study of 2004, 90% uh, of all Americans would be dead within a year after such an event. 90%. You ask how? Well, just a short while back, I was being interviewed on a radio station out of Phoenix. And this came up, and the question, well, gee, how? That seems a bit extreme. I said, okay, where does Phoenix get its water? I just heard your weather forecast, and it's 108 degrees. What percentage of your community uh, are retired elderly. How long do you think they're going to survive in 108 degree weather in houses that are designed for air conditioning and will therefore turn into ovens? Or talking to somebody up in Minnesota during the winter. Without electricity, where does our water come from? And then you have the cascading effect of where does the food come from? Average town has between 21 to 28 days of food supply on hand. That's everything from what is in your fridge to what is in a truck pulling out right now or backing into angles. 21 to 28 days, and then we run out of food. What about our medical supplies? For those of you who've read the book know that becomes a major plot point in terms of our main character's daughter being a diabetic. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but a fair percentage of us in this room are on some medications. Some of us, our lives are dependent on it. Do you realize that about 20 to 25% of the American population at any time is on some mood controlling or altering medication? We are the Prozac, Xanax, Wellbutrin generation, all right? Well, 20 to 25% of your neighbors are going to cold turkey on that. And if I don't have my Xanax before I give a speech, I'll throw my microphone or whatever. But no, seriously. About one half to one percent of the population without medication would be in jail because of severe psychotic situations. That they would be such a danger to society that they'd be locked up. And they were locked up 50 years ago. But as long as we keep them on their, med their meds, things are relatively... So you, you see my point here of all this cascading events that we're not prepared for. That's what an EMP will do to us. Now, let me give you the bad news. <laughs> Welcome to my nightmares. There's also something called CME that I was not aware of until a week after my book came out. One of my buddies called me. I said, Bill, you've got to read the book, The Sun Kings by Clark. It's, it's a book about 19th century solar astronomy. And by the time I got done reading that book, I was, oh my god. Because that turned me on to something. And OK, here's your next homework assignment. Look up the Carrington event. Carrington. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Carrington event. Okay. C A R R I N G T O N. Carrington event. About every 50 to 75 years, we get hammered by what's called a CME, coronal mass ejection. It is, well, picture it this way. You remember the science class where when the little kids and, and some kid holds up a grapefruit and that's the sun and the teacher has you <coughs> holding an apple or whatever and, and walking around. Okay, so all the time the sun is in a state of constant eruption and CMEs, coronal mass ejections, are blowing out. About every 50 to 75 years the random intersection finally happens that the earth, 93 million miles away, gets hit by one head on. It will create the same thing as an EMP. 
except it'll be a global event, not a military event, a global event. In other words, the entire power grid of the world is going to short offline from about 20 degrees north to 20 degrees south latitude. Think of the chaos then. I think we'd be in a global war within 48 hours for resources. We're not prepared for it at all. On average, it happens every 50 to 75 years. Uh, if you look at NASA, go into NASA NOAA, look at how seriously they're taking it. I, I went to talk to NASA, I was off. They called me up to come to Langley. And I'm an Apollo age kid. I mean, I, I was just like, these, are, these guys are like my heroes, you know? And, and I show up at this conference and they, they put me up front. Suddenly I'm staring at 300 guys and women who have their PhDs in nuclear physics, astrophysics. Uh, and suddenly I got really scared because I'm in the humanities. And, uh, I went to Purdue. And in the pecking order of trying to pick a girl up at a bar at Purdue, I mean, um, I'd go up and say, uh, hey, what's your sign? Well, that didn't work. I said, well, you know, I'm working on my PhD in history. And then there'd be a snicker, and, and, and another guy come up. Well, I'm getting my PhD in astrophysics. Boom, girl's got it. I've lost it. Right. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm intimidated by this audience. And I actually started off by saying, look, guys, uh, if you think I'm crazy, just boo me off the stage now, or tell me I'm nuts, because it will make me feel better. <laughs> and at the end of the hour, my closing statement was, you know, damn it, I feel worse walking out of here than when I walked in. They're more scared than I am. I shouldn't say scared. They're far more observant and aware of the probability. And we're looking at a peaking sometime in 2012. So, but you know what drives me nuts is because of popular media, this all gets confused into all this Mayan stuff, which drives me bloody insane. My editor wanted to try and turn my book into a Mayan book. I told him I would burn him. I also made a comment from The Godfather. <laughs> and I, I actually do know the secret of the Mayan calendar. You know, we've all heard about this. I know what happened. Okay, those of us who are old enough to remember writing papers in college, remember there was a thing called a typewriter? Oh, yes. and, and, and you put paper in it and you're typing and you're typing and suddenly you notice that the sound of the paper, it sounds different and you look and you go, crap, because the paper's like falling out of the typewriter, and that last sentence is going down like that, which means you've got to write the whole page over again. 3,000 years ago, this dude was making the calendar. And his boss came up to him one day and said, you know, you idiot, uh, you only got this much stone left. And there's still like 7,000 years ago. He said, well... Ah, oh, the hell with it. I'll just send it in May 2012. <laughs> so that's that's the secret of the mind. But to go serious, how did I get into writing this book? Um, seven years ago, July 28th, I believe it was. It might have been a pivotal day in American history. Two congressional committees have been meeting for a couple of years. One was Congressman Roscoe Bartlett's uh, task to evaluate the threat of EMP to America, which suggested reactions and what to do, of which ABM, uh, ballistic missile defense, and some other things were crucial. Another committee was working on the 9-11 report of what happened in the past. Whatever idiot scheduled this, scheduled it. On the same day, on Capitol Hill, both reports were released. The 9-11 report, everybody from mainstream media was packed into that room to grab, to remember the report that was this thick, trying to see some way to blame Bush for something. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody showed up for the EMP commission report. So I'm completely under the radar. On that day, I was in D.C. to work with Newt on our next book, which was actually about the Civil War. Newt comes in. Uh, he's late. I'm in hanging around the hotel waiting, and uh, knock on the door. He comes in uh, with a guy in a suit who obviously looked military, and uh, I won't repeat exactly what Newt said, but basically it was one: Are they going to wake up about EMP? 
And I looked at him and I said, you talking about electromagnetic pulse weapons? And he's like, well, how the heck do you know about that? And I was like, well, new. Uh, part of my PhD was in the history of military technology. By the end of that evening, rather than talking about the Civil War, we were talking about EMP. The guy with him is Captain Bill Sanders, who wrote the afterword for my book. He's yeah. one of my closest friends. Newt pushed me at that point. He said, there is no popular constituency regarding EMP. Write a novel. Get the word out through a novel. People glaze over on the scientific boards. He sent me over to meet Roscoe Bartlett. Roscoe Bartlett said the exact same thing. I was like, Bill, if, if you could write a book that raises popular awareness, that can help me get something done. I drove home, and I'm a single parent, and uh, got home. Somebody had been, one of my students had been taking care of my kid. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, I go in to peek in on her. And I will unashamedly admit, I took one look at her and I burst into tears. And I went and sat down because what I learned in the last 24 hours is like, my God, what do I do to protect my daughter? For the next year, I tried to write a book. I kept thinking Tom Clancy type stuff. You know, our hero, the bad guys are going to launch three missiles, our hero stops. But we get one to go off to scare the hell out of people or something. And then it hit me. I was stuck in a very boring graduation ceremony. Uh, they all are. Yeah. Yeah. But well, what's worse is when you're sitting up on the stage <laughs> and you're wearing all those fancy robes. And I tell people, I got my PhD. I, I grew up Catholic. I had robe envy. And I just. And it's the one chance for a straight guy to wear velvet. <laughs> I mean, you get to strut around like a peacock, you know? You just have a little air ball in your big tail. And, but I can't fall asleep because, you know, everybody's sitting there. And this speaker has been droning on for the last hour, which drives me insane. And it's hot, and it's 90 degrees, and then it's like God whispered in my ear. He said, take a look at the audience. The book is about us. It's about what happens to you. It's about what happens to your children or grandchildren. It's about my student graduating over there, who I love dearly. I spent four years with, and she's getting married next week. What kind of future does she have? What happens to my kid? What happens to my town? My town. So I set the book in Black Mountain. And that's how the book came out. It took me about 11 days to do first draft. I couldn't stop. Uh, it was just day and night for 11 days, and then just like complete collapse. And then a lot of revisions, and then a lot of arguing with editors. It would take five years from that until the book finally came out. And the situation just kept getting worse. Now, let me sum up what has been the response. <coughs> I've sold a lot of books. Um, you inspired us to do food Well, <laughs> the federal government, though, Congressman Bartlett. What a great man. I mean, he was thrilled. It was, it was an honor for me to be able to walk into his office and hand him a book and then deliver a case. And in fact, within the next couple of weeks, they're going to distribute a member to every member, book to every member of Congress. Twice now, bills have gone through the House with unanimous support, bipartisan, Benny Thompson, very liberal, Mississippi, allying with Roscoe Bartlett to get this through the House. One. One, one senator shelved it because he didn't have the perks that she wanted for her state. And also because she said there was a procedural problem with this. Because of this one woman from Alaska, uh, uh, uh. this bill was killed. We could have already been starting on the hardening of the infrastructure. It was on that day I gave up in one sense. By the way, you know that Congress uh, two years ago passed a law outlawing the ownership of chimpanzees. I'm serious. You got that through. I'm serious. It's against the law to own a chimpanzee. So if any of you ever come over to my house, you don't have to worry anymore. You know, cheetah is now out of the closet and is been sent away. Well, well, the point is, how the hell did Congress pass a law on chimpanzees but not on EMP? Well, we all recall there was that terrible tragedy. The woman whose face was torn off? Well, that triggered a constituency. 
People calling up their congressmen. I'm scared about chimpanzees running loose in the street. I will take care of this for you. <coughs> I will pass a bill. Now, you know how much it costs to pass a bill? Well, we're all protected from chimpanzees now. But we're not protected from EMP. And it was on that day I started, I had another epiphany. And that was the heck with it. We just start from the bottom up. And I fell in with a remarkable group uh, based out of Charlotte a couple months ago. Uh, Jan, where are I'm squinting at Jan, where are you? Over here. Yeah. Would you, would you please stand up and tell us what you do? We have a store in Waynesville. It's Carolina Readiness Supply. We have uh, things you're going to need when the power goes out. Oil lamps, food, a lot of bulk food, and we do food for long-term storage. Camping supplies, you know, whatever. <clears throat> Where is it located? You're trying to find it. Couldn't find it. We've moved. We're on at 72 Montgomery Street. All you got to do is call me, and I'll drive you in there. Grab her after the meeting, get her phone up. Now, Jan, when you first started planning your conference, how many people were you expecting to show up? I was hoping three or four hundred. Yeah, you had over 650, didn't you? Yeah, almost 700. This shows to me that this is happening all over the country. It was there that I met the head of NOAA, um, Sid Morris, who's working on, we're working on a three-tier project. And the idea is, first of all, we're Americans. We're Americans, all right? The American tradition was taking care of ourselves and self-sufficiency. Um, my favorite movie when I was a kid was Drums Alone and Mohawk. Yes. John Ford, remember? Yep. Indians and, and the British are coming, they ring the bell, everybody goes running into the fort together, and so there, there goes Widow McQuinnah's farm, and you know it's burning and such. Well, we're going to help them build it back after it's over. They didn't stand outside and hold up a sign, George Washington, would you please send some continental soldiers here? Um, not to make light of what was a great tragedy, but Joplin, Missouri. The footage we see of that, we do not see, well, if, if they did do this, they're one of the missing. We didn't see one person sitting in a lawn chair holding up a sign saying, FEMA, I'm here. But we did hear numerous stories of mothers knew what to do, grabbed their kid, put a bicycle helmet on him, threw him in, in the tub, threw a mattress over him, and then got on top. They were prepared. We as America are absolutely not prepared for a CME or an EMP. Well, one, one other thing about CME makes it even worse. You can preserve part of the system, but you have to turn the entire power grid of the United States off. So imagine if you're watching TV and say, ooh, that scary noise comes on. And it's like a message from our president says, well, we're going to get hit by CME folks. So we're turning electricity off in 10 minutes. We've got to figure out how we're going to turn it back on, but have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> remember to give your fair share. <laughs> <laughs> so. I was surprised at how inexpensive it really is to have a three month supply in my house to take care of my daughter and myself in the event of emergency. It doesn't require, now you can go high end and get the out home stuff and all that, but Jan can teach you better than I can how for a minimal investment, you can have three months. You know, when we had the, the blizzard last Christmas, you know, we, we won five days without power. And I said to Megan, okay, let's, let, let, this is a great time to try this out, Megan. So we got everything, all our stuff out and it all worked. And after five days, we saw a black hawk go over. And I was like, quick, quick, grab some black trash bags. She said, why? I said, put a sign outside. Drop vodka six. Because <laughs> I'd run out of boat, OK? <laughs> Particularly the six was driving me crazy. Uh, let's just say there's somebody in my neighborhood who was friends with Popcorn Sutton, but I'm not going to talk any further. Uh -oh. <laughs> that's, that's American. <laughs> So I'm going to present you with three things and I'm going to wrap up. Prepare yourselves. That's what Americans used to do. Those of us who recall parents and grandparents from the Depression <coughs> or grew up on farms. What was down in the basement? Months worth of food. My granny was obsessed with it. 
Yeah, but there, there, there had to be at least a couple months down there. We were in the middle of New York City, <laughs> you know, in Jersey. Um, secondly, organize. Somebody at Jan's conference really said something that I've repeated many times over now. And that person said, if I can convince one neighbor to say, read your book or whatever, but to become prepared, that's one less neighbor I have to worry about. Mm -hmm. It's one more neighbor on my side. I want to differentiate, and I hope I'm not insulting somebody here, I want to differentiate between survivalists and preppers. Survivalists think of my survival, my kid, the hell with the world, if need be. I'm a prepper. To me, a prepper is about how do we, together, work as a community. That we pull through as a community, together. And we can do it in the face of an emergency. We can buy time while infrastructure is being rebuilt. But we have to work as a community and not turn on each other. It's not that hard to do. What type of organizations am I find? I spoke to an incredible community meeting up in Mitchell County last month. Uh, talk to your, how many people here are first responders in some way? Firemen, police, EMTs? You, you, you talk with those people. You'd be surprised how many of them are up on it. A group like the Tea Party is a perfect group to start talking about how do we prepare to work as a community. Your churches. How many of you remember when we were kids, the civil defense pamphlets used to hand out in schools? Civic groups that you belong to. Yeah. Yeah. And duck and cover. Yeah, I love duck and cover because Nancy O'Cusi sat next to me. And I've seen Paris, I've seen France. But she was serious. Then your county level. People here, is anybody in here running for county office or town office? This should become part of the agenda. How do we work together in the event of a major emergency? How do we sustain ourselves for a month on our own if we're cut off? And then we go to the state and find the feds will maybe wake up and tag along 10 years down the road. But we prepare ourselves. A message. Uh, I want to wrap up with one thing I'm related to that. And then let's just do some quick questions and answers. Next year is about winning. I've been in politics for 20 years. Uh, I met Newt when he was still minority whip. Uh, Newt and I had a long conversation today. I think it's okay for me to say that one of the things he's going to try and push for with all of the candidates, and this is whether you support Newt or not, but what Newt is pushing for with all the candidates is that when this primary is over, we are all part of the same team. Because there is only one thing that counts in 2012, and that is winning. That is taking back the presidency. That is building a 60% foolproof majority in both houses. And then that becomes reality. That's only going to become reality if we work together. So I'm urging everyone here that, to me, a primary is like a family squabble. You know, when, when I grew up in a row home in New Jersey, there was family squabbles every night. Because yeah. <laughs> you, you could spit out the window and, and land it in the kitchen of your neighbor. So you knew. But you know, if the, if the fight was getting bad, every, the family would close the windows and close the door, and they'd all yell at each other, and they finally settled. All right? um, a primary season is a family squabble. We're all united by the same vision for the future. Uh, in fact, I'm going to put you guys on the spot. I'm asking candidates here, win or lose. I, I see two of you here. Do we have anyone else running? Thomas. See Ed, Daniel. That no matter who wins the primary, the day after, we all stand united as a family because we have a target. And his name is Schuler, and his name is Obama, and we're here because whoever wins is going to be protecting this, the Constitution of the United States. So that's what I'm here for.
And I'm going to ask the candidates, would you guys pledge that? Win or lose? The following day, Ed, if he wins, the following day, would you pledge that you will take all your resources, all your time, all your effort, everybody who supports you, into his camp? Or if he wins, the following day, you are standing with him 100%. I want to see a press conference the following day of every single candidate standing together and say, this is our winner, and we're going to stand with this guy because we know what we want from the winner. So that's my pitch of putting you guys on the spot. Okay, I'm going to close with Abraham Lincoln. And that is, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration shall be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance nor insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass shall light us down in honor or dishonor unto the latest generation. The Patriots of 1776 believed in that. They went through a fiery trial for eight years to give us this. We went through a bitter four-year civil war. Uh, the question is the definition of this. And sitting in this room tonight are people who still disagree over it, but we're all sitting here as Americans. We are in the middle of a fiery trial. I think this is the most important election since 1860. Let's go through the fiery trial and make sure our grandchildren's grandchildren can still hold this and say, this is my constitution. So thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Yes, sure. Questions? Now, I'm squinting. <laughs> Dan, didn't you tell me I shouldn't have done this surgery? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Uh, and I'll repeat the question. I spent a career in the aerospace industry back in the 70s. Uh, one of my buddies was. Were you the guy who was always picking up the girls where I was getting shot down? <laughs> no, I used to get shot down all the time. <laughs> Don't touch me. <laughs> uh, spent a, a career in, in uh, the aerospace industry back in about the 70s. One of my buddies was telling me about a company he worked for that made an EMP machine that he'd take around to various companies and demonstrate how their device wouldn't work after he pushed his button once. And they proved this to a lot of people. And I think DARPA eventually probably learned about it. Do you have any um, insight into what maybe DARPA or the government knows about EMP and has well, done to alleviate any problems? What does the government know about EMP? Heck, they know a lot. Um, I've lost track of the number of conferences I've been sent to. I've been at the War College. I've been sent to various labs and such. And it's kind of funny when you go into the room and there's a uh, black cloth covering different things in the room, and there's a big sign up on you know, the, the PowerPoint, declassified, or unclassified setting. And then once they take me out of the room, because I don't have security clearance, and Newt told me not to get it, because once you do, everything you write has to be vetted by the government. That book would have had to be reviewed by some bureaucrat, and I'd still be waiting. So, uh, but yeah. We've known about it for years. In fact, the group I'm associated with, uh, NOAA, we're buying an EMP generator so that we can test various things to see how we can prove them. You can go online and buy an EMP generator. You can get a good one out of India for about ten to fifteen thousand. Uh, if you're good with a soldering gun, you can make one a lot cheaper. It's it's really easy to make. Thing is, now we're only talking about something that will will pulse out maybe to the size of this room. Uh, what I was talking about, the scenario is container ship, Gulf of Mexico, three scuds pop off, loft up, five to seven minutes later, detonations over East United States, Central United States, Western United States, everything's gone, container ship blows up, that's it, it's over. But uh, yeah, government knows about it. I'll tell you one thing, how many of you, was it Berkeley or Beverly, West Virginia? Beckley. Yeah, where all the bureaucrats are going to go, yeah. <laughs> stuff goes bad. <laughs> no, it's a Denver airport. Yeah. 
Okay, who's next? So I'll, let, I'll try and keep these at 30 seconds. What do you have in your home protected by a Faraday cage? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Pardon? I'm not going to tell you. Ah, no, what, okay, let me rephrase it. What should I have in my home what should protected you have in your by a Faraday cage? Um, if you have a vehicle post 70s uh, that you want to keep running, uh, you should talk to, go online, there's, there's sources. That, it, the amount of information on the internet about EMP now is amazing. And it will give you a rundown of what components on your car uh, should be Faraday caged or you have replacement parts for. Um, radio. You definitely want a radio. If you have a two-way communication system, even better. That should all be Faraday caged. A Faraday cage is simply nothing but, it's, it's an EMP shield. It's very, very simple to make. You can go to uh, Lowell's and you can buy the parts for about 20, 30 bucks and make one. By the way, you already have one. It's called a microwave. It's a Faraday cage. You just have it in the basement, have it, make sure it's grounded but not plugged in, stick whatever you want inside of it. It's cool. You can protect it. Stick the wire, wrap a wire. Yeah, wrap a wire around, stick it into the ground. Ma'am? Okay. Next. <laughs> Sir? Oh, hi, Ed. I, I read your book last month, so uh, it's a little bit. Welcome to my nightmares. I really enjoyed it. I, I was wondering, I was, it was very interesting to see the discussion about the uh, suspension of constitutional rights, like you know, right of jury uh, for trial, you know, like they executed a and things like that, and the confiscation of property by uh, the town. Did you get a negative reaction? Oh, Did sure. discuss that? Sure, the book, uh, last count, had 740 reviews on Amazon, which is stunning. Uh, oh, I, I, I've been attacked from every angle on that. Uh, the only one that really ticked me off now, this one really ticked me off, was the guy said that he was reading the book, but when he got to the part where the main character started to say a Hail Mary, that this was a pagan uh, worshiping of the Antichrist Pope, and that this book made him sick, and uh, he, he burned it or something. That's one, of, that's one of the few people I responded to. I said, listen, I'm from Jersey. I know a lot of guys are Catholic. Would you tell me where you live? I don't want to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> That's the only one that really upset me. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is a question of what lines get drawn in a post-catastrophe as to you have resources, other people don't, what gets taken, what doesn't. And I did a lot of thinking about how would a community function and try and maintain some level of civilization, try and maintain some level of what we are as Americans. Uh, the execution scene was very controversial a lot of people. <coughs> I did that deliberately. I want people to think. By the way, welcome to my nightmares. <laughs> How many have read the book? Several. Sure. <laughs> Why don't you have me here? Yeah. I'll okay, I'm going to tell you a funny story. We've been passing it around. Okay, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Big thunderstorm about some months back. And my daughter and I were watching the big 60-inch screen. You know, come, come on, we're all addicted to this stuff. And about six, seven miles away, up the valley, over by Oteen, a lightning bolt must have hit something big, because the whole valley, all the way up to Black Mountain, just winked off. All right, so we're sitting there. I'm being cool, and my daughter finally looks and goes, "Daddy, <laughs> said, look, sweetheart, just get your cell phone out," which I had already sneaked out to look at. You know, it's, it's still functioning. We're cool. <laughs> and, 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 and it's just a light. And about a minute or two later, my phone rings, and it was an administrator who will remain anonymous from the college. Oh my God, Bill, is this really it? <laughs> so I, I, I was like, yeah. yeah, we're screwed. It's really it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I actually commented, is your cell phone working and are you talking to me? He goes, yeah. I said, and Sid goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't give my name out. <laughs> 
but then for the next two hours, my phone was ringing every couple minutes, and I'd answer it. It'd be, you rotten son of a fucking my, my poor husband is down in the basement, and he's saying, this is it. Now we get on the phone and say, oh, it's, it's, it's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. It's just chill. Who's <laughs> 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 next? <laughs> Uh, Ma'am? I'm going to ask a, a question sure. um, that I sort of started to ask earlier. Is, uh, you talk about going back into the um, 15th century. I'm betting we go back into the 18th century when 90% of this country didn't even know what an electric light bulb was. And we're, we're perfectly capable of canning their own food, growing their own food, uh, cobbling their own shoes, making their own cloth. You know, well, they didn't make that much cloth, I have to admit. But uh, making their own clothes, people were capable of taking care of themselves just with a farm. They bought maybe sugar. They bought maybe saltpeter. You know, the, the coffee thing, they didn't have to have coffee. Well, you get the tea. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> mint tea. <laughs> Go in the backyard. Um, I think we're perfectly capable of dropping back to that. Um, you raise a good point, but the reason I say 15th century rather than 18th, or my hero, Dr. Pry, who was part of the commission, said 19th century. The big difference is the people in the 19th and the 18th century knew how to live in the 19th and the 18th century. We do not. The vast majority of us do not. Yeah. Uh, how, how many of us have actually slaughtered, killed, slaughtered, and properly prepared an animal for the winter? Well, yeah, I mean, we can get into a why I have that skill, I have that skill, but the point is, the vast majority do not. Particularly the eastern United States, the carrying capacity of this land pre industrial could at most support 30 to 50 million people in a pre industrial ag ag agricultural system. We need a vast distribution system. Next time you walk into the market and you go take a look at the fresh fruit section, try and figure out where some of that stuff came from. So all the infrastructure is gone. And the reason I say 15th century is within a matter of weeks, plagues, actual plagues, unheard of in 100 years will be sweeping across the country. It will be like the 15th century. Typhoid. Typhoid is always just around the corner. All, right. all you need is a couple people who are transitioning at a Charlotte airport <laughs> to have been carrying, have been coming back from Africa or someplace, carrying an exotic, and it, and, and it leaps. We are wide open now to a series of plagues and diseases. And then also the social chaos, social breakdown, was very reminiscent of what happened during the Thirty Years' War, but when all the social structure broke down. If you have isolated communities, uh, they'll burn out from the plague and you won't have the infrastructure spreading it. It's the density of the population at the start that's going to really nail us. You're going to have, ten, you're going to have our natural instinct is going to be people are going to head to the interstate and start walking. Yeah. And then the disease path just follows. Any, one, one or two more and then we'll wrap it up for the night. You can all go home, put on your 16 inch screens and put on something fun. Sir? Um, I was going to ask you about the inspiration for the cannibalism. Ah, oh, gosh. That was another thing I got nailed for with critics. Why did I put cannibalism into the book? Um, I'm a historian. And 1986, I led a group of students to Leningrad. Um, it turned into a major diplomatic thing. CBS News, Charles Corral, actually sent a crew with us. And I kept insisting that I wanted to take my students to the cemetery at Leningrad. The city of Leningrad was sieged for 900 days by the Nazis. Somewhere around a million and a half people, civilians died. Uh, they triaged the population, and that went into the book. Uh, the ration for non-essentials went to 700 calories a day two slices of bread, of which 30 to 50% of the content of the bread was wood pulp. Why wood pulp? Because when you ate it, the wood pulp swelled up in your stomach and made you feel like you had something in you. Uh, 
combat soldiers got about 2,000 calories a day, factory workers about 1,500 calories. A million and a half people died. I kept asking my guide, I want my students to go to this cemetery. Well, we went. Last day, I had to push her. And it was one of the most heartbreaking things I've been through because she, she disintegrated. We're looking, each man's grave is about the size of this room, and it would just simply have a stone on it that said 6,000, 1942. 8,000, 1941. And there was like 50, 100 of these in this field. And our guide told us, she said, Some, I think it's this, it's this, my entire family's in here. I'm the only one that survived. I was 12 years old. My entire family died. Well, the Soviet government kept classified a lot of the information. Harrison Salisbury, in his book, The 900 Days, mentioned it. After the somewhat spring-like opening of Soviet archives in the 90s, with researchers were getting in there, uh, it's all sealed back again. Um, cannibalism was rampant in Leningrad. There was even a social custom. Friends gave their young children to each other. They couldn't eat their own children. So they would arrange with their neighbor that when my child dies, you can have my child to eat. And when your child dies, give it to my family. <coughs> there are people alive in the Soviet Union now, Russia, who lived through that, who still remember it. We in America have never known such horror. But it has happened in other places in the world. It happened in Leningrad, it happened in Stalingrad, it happened in many a city in China during World War II. It's happened throughout history. It could happen in America. Is that where you got, got your dog being given to the nation? Yes, ma'am. One last question. And then somebody make a happy comment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Do you, do you really feel, as in your book, that a town such as Black Mountain would be able to pull together as they did? I believe absolutely yes. I believe we're Americans. I believe that bred into us is, is a sense of what we are as Americans. You know, um, the historian Stephen Ambrose, uh, I, I had some difficulty. In fact, on a very personal level, Stephen Ambrose and I had a very nasty skirmish once. Uh, and I was a small guy, and he's a big guy. But remember, he's a very famous historian. And he commented, he said, during World War II, he said, throughout history, he said, how many armies in history, when advancing into enemy country, the civilians would come out tearfully knowing they were safe? was the American Army, it was Americans. Uh, I've talked to many a German who was a child saying that, or no, not Germans, I mean people who, who survived in occupied countries, who as children were terrified of anybody. A man in a uniform was to be feared. He could rape your sister, he could kill you. He would take your neighbors away. And suddenly one day these strange big men show up. And what are they doing? They're handing out candy. And they're saying you're safe, it's okay. Because we're Americans. Um, if we get into sociology, we look at how big can an element or a group be before it fractures into subgroupings. And that's a very crucial question. And in fact, I'd say that applies even to the Tea Party. How big can the movement go before it can potentially fracture into sub-elements and suddenly be in rivalry with each other? For heaven's sake, do not let that happen to you. We're talking Tea Party now, not post-apocalypse, all right? But a community like Black Mountain, uh, I think, could actually pull together and pull through. I notice I'm very cynical about Asheville. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think your, your average community is three to 5,000. Now, if you live in a large city, then what do you do? You, you, you find the group that you know that you all can work together. That would be a church group or your community group or something like that, or the Tea Party. Don't you have to have a geographic continuity? 
Yeah, geographic continuity would help. Uh, a church group but, may not necessarily work. But a church group could work in the sense that we all know that there's an emergency. Go to the church. We all agree. Let's say we're all in the same congregation and, and we meet. Okay, if it goes down, here is where you bring your children, here's where you bring your families, we have supplies in the basement, here's where we meet, here's where we start to reorganize. Here's where you'll be safe. Part of our parish includes the doctor over there, these three nurses over here, these two policemen. We know we can work together as a group with God's help. Because we're Americans. I've promised my daughter that the next book I write yeah. is going to be something like Happy Bunny Goes to Town. <laughs> <laughs> Good night.